Dear Father in heaven, we are thankful for the Sabbath day and uh, for the fellowship that we can have with you and with each other. We just ask for your spirit's presence here as we open your word, as we look at uh, the parallels of the experience of the Millerites and the disciples. We know, Lord, that these are not just dead facts of history, but they are something that uh, can touch our lives even today. So we just ask for the illumination of your spirit. Be with each one here. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, welcome everyone. Um, I'm going to be speaking on the parallels first between the disciples and that of the Millerites. And in the second lecture that I'm going to have, uh, later, I'll be talking about the Millerites and the 144,000. In a sense, the parallel between the disciples, Millerites, and the 144,000 because they all parallel each other. Now, the first statement here from Great Controversy 351 uh, says, The experience of the disciples who preach the gospel of the kingdom at the first advent of Christ has its counterpart in the experience of those who proclaimed the message of his second advent. The preaching of the disciples in regard to time was based upon the 70 weeks of Daniel 9. The message given by Miller and his associates announced the termination of the 2300 days of Daniel 814, of which the 70 weeks form a part. The preaching of each was based upon a fulfillment of a different portion of the same great prophetic period. Like the first disciples, William Miller and his associates did not themselves fully comprehend the import of the message which they bore. Errors that had been long established in the church prevented them from arriving at a correct interpretation of an important point in the prophecy. Therefore, though they proclaimed the message which God had committed to them to be given to the world, yet through a misapprehension of its meaning, they suffered disappointment. And so what we are looking at here is the disappointment of the Millerites and the disappointment of the disciples. Now, I'm going to look at um, reform lines here a little bit. I'm not going to be doing a presentation on reform lines in detail, but these, both the Millerites and the disciples and the 144,000, follow the pattern of the reform lines. Now the first thing that we have is a time of the end, which uh, there's different ways in which we can look at this, but for each generation, there appears to be a time of the end, a time in which a message, uh, or not each generation, but each movement, each reform line, a time of the end in which these people recognize that something has come to an end. And we saw that with the disciples, they were preaching the end of the 70 weeks. With the Millerites, they were preaching the end of the 2300 days. Both of these, it's always preceded by a period of darkness. And then there's an increase of light. And then the message is formalized and it becomes present truth. And we have the first message will be preached. And then that message, of course, is going to be dealing with the end of that period. Time is at hand. So people recognize that there's this time of the end. And then there's a second message which will deal with uh, the opposition that this message brings. And in different reform lines, it shows up differently. So some of these things are the details of them. You know, If we were do, to do a study on the reform lines, there's lots of detail dealing with the activities of the enemies but it deals with the op opposition. We also have then a third message, and in this third message, two classes of worshipers uh, are demonstrated. This message also is the one that brings the disappointment, and there is a shut door, and there's stuff connected with the shut door as well that we will look at, and it's also connected to the covenant. Now, uh, after that, the number seven comes to, into play. And in different reform lines, this shows up in different ways, but the number seven is important. And then there's a work that is done. And then there comes a backsliding, 
or vacillating. And then the message is going to re be repeated. In the fourth message, all the first three messages will be repeated. Oops, I should go back. So this is really a rough outline of the reform lines. And uh, I'm not an expert on the reform, li reform lines. I haven't really spent as much time on that as I have on other things. So unfortunately, uh, some of you are going to have to help me. Maybe that's fortunate as we go through some of these things, some of these details. I borrowed uh, some of these PowerPoints from others because it takes time to draw these. But you know, I was borrowing these things and I took things out that I didn't understand. And some of them I left in and later on you'll see that. Now one of the things that we look at when we compare the Millerites and the disciples is there are certain things that they have in common. Uh, the first thing, of course, that we see with these reform lines is this time of darkness and then a message based on time prophecy. And then there's a misunderstanding of the event that this, that's going to happen at the end of this prophecy. There's a warning given about the event, but it is ignored. There's also an apparent confirmation of hopes. And then they experience a disappointment. And after the disappointment with both the disciples and the Millerites, uh, insight is given to two minor disciples. And then there's a change in Christ's ministry that occurs. They all have the right message in the right time, but the wrong event. And then they are told to prophesy again. And then uh, there is also a shut door message in connection with it. So these aren't all exactly in order, but all these things occur, both for the disciples and the Millerites. So we're going to look at the disciples here first. Um, in the timeline of the disciples, we're going to look at some verses here that deal with this time of darkness. Now, the first verse is in Isaiah 60, verse 1 to 3. So if you want, you can turn there, but it is on the screen. Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee, and the Gentiles shall come to thy light, and the kings to the brightness of thy rising. And this is also talked about in Isaiah 9, verse 2. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shined. And this is quoted in Matthew chapter 4, verse 16. The people which sat in darkness saw a great light, and to them which sat in the region and shadow of death, light is sprung up. So we can see that before uh, Christ came, there was a time of darkness. And then there is a message that's given. And we could look at this in more detail, but obviously we know that part of this message was John the Baptist. And uh, um, we can look at some verses even in Christ's message. Of course, the message was, uh, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Right? And it says, now after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. So you can see that this time that is fulfilled is the time prophecy of the 70 weeks, right? the 490 years. Repent ye and believe the gospel. And here we have it in Daniel 9. Seventy weeks are determined or cut off upon thy people. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the prince, shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. So that's from 457 B.C. until 27 A.D. And after threescore and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. So in the midst of the week, 31 AD. And at the end, of course, of all those 70 weeks is 34 AD. But the time that they're looking for is not necessarily the close of the 70 weeks, but they're looking at the close of the six, three score and two weeks, seven weeks, three score and two weeks, which is 69 weeks. So 27 AD, so at the time of Christ, there was definitely a recognition that this prophecy was being fulfilled. Now, in this message, then, there is an increase of light, of course, through John the Baptist, preparing the way for Christ uh, and an understanding of the prophecies. 
And then uh, at some point there is the apparent confirmation of expectations. And we look at this here. This is in Matthew chapter 21, verse 1 to 11. And when they drew nigh unto Jerusalem and were come to Bethphage, unto the Mount of Olives, then sent Jesus two disciples, saying unto them, Go into the village over against you, and straightway ye shall find an ass tied, and a colt with her. Loose them, and bring them unto me. And if any man say, say aught unto you, ye shall say, The Lord hath need of them, and straightway he will send them. All this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets, saying, Tell ye the daughter of Zion, Behold, thy king cometh unto thee, meek, and sitting upon an ass, and a colt, the full of an ass. And the disciples went, and did as Jesus commanded them, and brought the ass and the colt, and put on them their clothes, and they set, them th set him thereon. And a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees, and strawed them in the way. And the multitudes that went before, and that followed, cried, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he was come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth, Nazareth of Galilee. So here we can see in Christ, their expectations were for this king to come riding into Jerusalem to overthrow the Romans. And this was in anticipation uh, of their expectations. It was an apparent confirmation of their expectations. But of course, it didn't go exactly the way that they planned. So the next thing is we have the activities of the enemies. And of course, this happened through Christ's life um, in the scheming and so forth uh, in trying to set him up. So you know, I don't know if we need to go into that into too much detail. But it does lead to, of course, the disappointment, which is the cross. So we can see that their expectations were crushed. It says, but we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And beside all this, today is the third day since these things were done. So we can see that they were looking for this Messiah, and, but they were disappointed. From that time forth, Jesus, or forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go into Jerusalem. Now this is um, uh, how they were warned. And suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me. For thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. So Christ tried to warn them uh, regarding uh, the events that were going to happen in his life. But of course they didn't anticipate those things. Now, we're going to compare this a little bit. We're going to look at the disciples and the Millerites, or the Adventists in 1844, and compare these different aspects of what happened. So is everybody following this so far? Is this easy enough to follow? Okay, so the message was the kingdom of is at hand. The time is fulfilled. Mark 1 verse 14 to 15 and Matthew 10 7 deals with that we looked at those verses and of course the time is fulfilled Christ is returning that was the message of the Millerites now the disciples as we said was based on the 490 years of Daniel 9 verse 24 to 27 and the Millerites was based upon the 2300 years of Daniel 8 verse 14 and Revelation 14 verse 6 and 7 which is the first angels message right which we could look at it, people, but if you're not, if anybody wants me to stop and you want me to clarify something, just stop me and we can clarify it. And if somebody needs a Bible verse read, you know, we can have it read. So the misunderstanding of event due to influence of prevailing views. Uh, with the disciples, they believed that the Messiah would set up an earthly kingdom. The, the Millerites believed that the sanctuary was the earth. Miller accepted the generally received view that in the Christian age, the earth is the sanctuary, and he therefore understood that the cleansing of the sanctuary foretold in Daniel 8.14 represented the purification of the earth by fire at the second coming of Christ. If then the correct starting point could be found for the 2300 days, he concluded that the time of the second advent could be readily ascertained. 
thus would be revealed the time of that great consummation, the time when the present state, with all its pride and power, its pomp and vanity, wickedness and oppression, would come to an end, when the curse would be removed from off the earth, when death would be destroyed, reward be given to the servants of God, to the prophets and saints, and all them that fear his name, and those be destroyed who destroy the earth. So he was looking at everything ending at the end of the 2300 days, um, but it was from a misunderstanding of this. And of course, we talked about the warnings received. Jesus warned uh, the disciples, Matthew 16, verse 21, talking about the death that he was going to die. With the Adventist, William Foy had a vision in 1842, and um, is anybody not familiar with William Foy? So he was a black Adventist preacher who received a vision after uh, Ellen White uh, gave one of her visions. He recognized that it was a similar vision, and we're going to actually look at that in more detail later on, but for now, uh, just that's what we have there in looking at this. So we're just going over this really quickly. So they missed part of the passage. What they missed in the disciples' time was Christ's death, right? The Messiah being cut off. Whoops. And in the Millerite time period, they missed the third angel's message, which, you know, I find kind of interesting. You know, they recognized the first angel's message, and then when the second angel's message came along, they recognized the second angel's message. But when the third angel's message was written there very plainly, they never thought about, hey, you know, what about this third angel's message? Okay? I, I mean, it's peculiar. The things that we sometimes don't see that are right in front of our noses. Okay, yeah, here is a bit more about William Foy. It says, Mr. Foy's work continued until the year 1844, near the close of the 2300 days of Daniel 8.14. He, then he was favored with another manifestation of the Holy Spirit. A third vision was given, one which he did not understand. In this was shown him a pathway of the people of God through to the heavenly city. He saw a great platform on which the multitudes of people gathered. Occasionally, one would drop through this platform out of sight, and of such a one it was said to him apostatized. And then he saw the people rise to a second platform. So that's the second angel's message. And some of these also dropped through the platform out of sight. And finally, a third platform appeared, which extended to the gates of the holy city. A great company gathered with those who had advanced to this platform. As he expected the Lord Jesus to come in a very short time, he failed to recognize the fact that a third message was to follow the first and second messages of Revelation 14. Consequently, the vision to him was inexplicable and he ceased public speaking. After the close of the prophetic period in the year 1845, he heard Mrs. E.G. Harmon relate the same vision, which is Ellen White, of course, with the explanation that the first and second messages had been given and that a third was to follow. Uh, he's, now, this is Loughborough's uh, notes. Actually, Mr. Foy lived until 1893, so, but he was lost track of, so I guess Loughborough assumed that he had died uh, soon after this, he says, however, Mr. Foy sickened and died, which he didn't. So. so the apparent confirmations of hopes, as we saw with the disciples of the triumphal entry of Christ into Jerusalem, with the Millerites, the midnight cry is the parallel event. And, you know, it's hard to imagine. I mean, I sometimes wish I was there to see what happened um, with this message. But uh, on the first day of the fifth month of 1844, when Samuel Snow came into the camp meeting on a Wednesday, and, he, and Joseph Bates let him go up and speak and present for the first time Christ's uh, week, final week. So part of that message was the 2520 of Christ, but uh, also that Jesus was coming back on October 22nd, 1844. And um, that message was an amazing message, that it went and traveled around uh, so quickly in such a s short period. Now, of course, the cry was given, as we're going to read here, our hopes now centered on the coming of the Lord in 1844. This also, 
was also the time for the message of the second angel who, flying through the midst of heaven, cried, Babylon has fallen, has fallen, that great city, Revelation 14.8. That message was first proclaimed by the servants of God in the summer of 1844. As a result, many left the fallen churches. In connection with this message, the midnight cry, and of course that midnight cry comes from the parable of the ten virgins, and we're going to look at that in, not in great detail, but we're going to look at it a bit more in the second lecture was given, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. In every part of the land, light was given concerning this message. And the cry arose thousands. It went from city to city, from village to village, and into the remote country regions. It reached the learned and talented, as well as the obscure and humble. That's Christian experience and teachings, I believe, 50 and 51. Okay, now the disappointment, of course, that's the part that we recognize readily. The disciples, their disappointment had to do with Christ's death. Now, I remember when I first became an Adventist, the first book I read was Kingdom of the Cults by Walter Martin in the appendix, The, Publi the Puzzle of Seventh-day Adventism. And in that uh, appendix, he refers to Walter Bar or, no, Donald Barnhouse's comments that the disappointment of the Millerites in 1844, the, well, the Seventh-day Adventists of Christ moving into the sanctuary is the greatest face-saving device in history. So his view was that we created this whole thing of the sanctuary in heaven just to save face. But the same thing has been said of the disciples in the time of Christ. It's a very parallel history, not just in what happened to them, but also the criticisms of the enemies. Um, so for many people, it was just, you know, Jesus died, well, we're going to look at Old Testament prophecies, twist them around, and somehow create that, that that's what we, you know, was supposed to happen. But we can see, of course, uh, this is what was supposed to happen and the parallel of it. So uh, in the disciples and the Millerites, they both have this experience. Now in Revelation 10, verse 9 to 10, it says, Take and eat it up. And, make, and it shall make thy belly bitter. Now, of course, this is the little book that was opened, which is the prophecies in the book of Daniel. But it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey, and, when, and it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. So this refers to their experience, the bitterness of their experience. Now, as far as the insight given to two minor disciples, uh, Jesus on the road to Emmaus met two disciples and walked with them and opened to them the scriptures and help them understand what was happening, what was the significance of his sacrifice upon the cross by pointing, him to the, pointing them to the prophecies. And one was named Cleopas. Um, after 1844, Hiram Etson and another brother were walking through a cornfield. And uh, I think Hiram and Etson kind of lagged behind, or the other guy lagged behind, I can't remember exactly. One of them lagged behind the other. So. And uh, Hiram Etson saw Christ moving from the holy to the most holy place in sort of a vision, but he understood that some event had happened. So this insight was given. And of course, this insight has to do with the change in Christ's ministry. Christ moved from the holy place, or moved to the holy place. In Hebrews 1 verse 3, it talks about that. In the Millerite period, Christ moved to the most holy place to begin. Somebody have a question? No? Okay. Now, of course, they're told to preach again. So in the book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 8, it says, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And in Revelation 10, it says, And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. Of course, this is right after the eating of the little book and the bitter experience that we saw back here, which was Revelation 10, verse 9 and 10. So that's, uh, that's verse 11. So it's the next verse. Now the shut door is an interesting part. One of the things it's, uh, it's criticized by... Um, the enemies of Adventism, that Ellen White believed in a shut door, that the world was lost. And of course, that's what they believed. When 
probation, they believed that a probation had closed, and a probation had closed. There was a shut door. It wasn't quite what they thought. There were people that were still open to salvation, but their first impression was that some people, um, you know, that had not accepted the third angel's message were, or the second angel's message, um, and the third angel's message, accepted the sanctuary and so forth, those people were going to be lost. But anyway, I'm going to read here from First Selected Messages. It is claimed that these expressions prove the shut, shut door doctrine. This is from uh, page 62. And that this is the reason of their omission in later editions. But in fact, they teach only that which has been and is still held by us as a people, as I shall show. For a time after the disappointment in 1844, I did hold, in common with the Advent body, that the door of mercy was then forever closed to the world. This position was taken before my first vision was given me. It was the light given me of God that corrected our error and enabled us to see the true, uh, the true position. I am still a believer in the shut door theory, but not in the sense in which we first employed the term or in which it is employed by my opponents. There was a shut door in Noah's day. There was, at that time, a withdrawal of the Spirit of God from the sinful race that perished in the waters of the flood. God himself gave the shut door message to Noah. My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be in 120 years. There was a shut door in the days of Abraham. Mercy ceased to plead with the inhabitants of Sodom, and all but Lot, with his wife and two daughters, were consumed by the fire sent down from heaven. There was a shut door in Christ's day. The Son of God declared to the unbelieving Jews of that generation, Your house is left unto you desolate. Matthew 23, 38. Looking down the stream of time to the last days, the same infinite power proclaimed through John, these things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. I was shown in vision and still believe that there was a shut door in 1844. All who saw the light of the first and second angel's messages and rejected that light were left in darkness. And those who accepted it and received the Holy Spirit, which attended the proclamation of the message from heaven, and who afterward renounced their faith and pronounced their experience a delusion, thereby rejected the Spirit of God, and, an, and it no longer pleaded with them. Those who did not see the light had not the guilt of its rejection. It was only the class who had despised the light from heaven that the Spirit of God could not reach. And this class included, as I have stated, both those who refused to accept the message when it was presented to them, and also those who, having received it, afterward renounced their faith. These might have a form of godliness and profess to be followers of Christ, but having no living connection with God, they would be taken captive by the delusions of Satan. These two classes are brought to view in the vision. Those who declared the light which they had followed a delusion, and the wicked of the world who, having rejected the light, had been rejected of God. No reference is made to those who had not seen the light, and therefore were not guilty of its rejection. So, I mean, there's more I have here. I have a whole bunch of notes on the, the shut door. But um, that's probably enough to get the idea. So, now there was also a shut door mentality that, so we're talking about Ellen White's first uh, reaction, or the early Adventist first reaction that they had uh, towards non-Adventists. So there was this idea that, you know, people who had rejected Miller's teachings or who had who had not even accepted them were somehow lost, that the world was lost. Um, same thing happened towards the Gentiles in the book of Acts, chapter 10. So I could read some of that, but uh, we're probably, you know, going to run out of time a little bit here, I think. Um, but, well, I can look at it a little bit, because Acts chapter 10 is 48 verses, so I'm not going to read all those. But it's the story of Cornelius and Peter dealing with... Um, the vision that Peter has on the rooftop of all these beasts and fowls and creeping things, you know, and God says to him, or a voice says to him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter said, not so, Lord, for I've never eaten anything that is common or unclean. So God was trying to teach him that the Gentiles were open to salvation. Right? So this is, uh, so that shut door mentality that existed after the disappointment of the Millerites also had existed after the disappointment of the disciples of Christ. So we can see that parallel. So I just wanted to make that clear. 
So there was the right message, the right time, and the wrong event for both of these people. They misunderstood the event that was to happen. Now I'm going to go through a little bit of these timelines, and I'm going to do this also in the second lecture. Um, as I said, I'm not an expert on uh, the reform lines, but we can see that uh, in Christ's time, or the time of the disciples, John the Baptist preached a message, and there was an increase of light. So the fulfillment of prophecy, Christ is born, as is John the Baptist. And then we get this message, which moves through time. The wise men, the shepherds, the angels formalize the message, the Messiah is born. So we get this message being presented. And uh, at Christ's baptism, we have the parallel to the first angel's message. Right? Christ is baptized by John the Baptist, and the Holy Spirit descends upon Christ. And then we have in the second angel's message the opposition that happens and a closing of the door uh, to those uh, who are, are opposed to Christ. And then we have uh, Christ entering Jerusalem, right? So that's the triumphal entry where he says the very rocks would cry out. And um, we also had the high priest made a prediction too. What was the prediction the high priest made? The one man might die to save the nation. The high priest, yes. Yeah, then the whole nation perish, something to that effect. So, of course, this is uh, dealing with Christ's death. See, it says it's plain animation, and it's kind of different. Okay, the third angel of message is parallel to the crucifixion, right? So Jesus Christ is crucified at that point. We get uh, a disappointment. Uh, they go fishing. They backslide. The disciples backslide. And darkness and the work, they go into darkness and the work is given. Encouragement and instruction prepared for the work. This brings forth true worship. So Christ comes, calls them once again to go and preach again. And, of course, this leads to Pentecost. Right? In very short order, the first three angels are repeated, and they are empowered. So we get um, the fourth angel. So we have this parallel that happens in the Millerite period. So I see how that works there. Yeah, it looks pretty good. So, of course, we have a time in the end in 1798. The message is formalized in 1833, and... Uh, the first angel's message. What happens uh, August 11th, 1840? Okay, and what does that do to this message? It empowers the first angel's message. Okay. Oops. Everything just jumped there all of a sudden. Okay, so, yep, so we have Josiah Litch predicts the end of the Ottoman Empire based on Revelation 9.15. And then we have, um, I guess it's all just going to jump all in all at once. It's not going to go gradually. So we have the second angel's message, June 1842, doors closed. What happens in the Millerite time period in 1842? What causes the doors to close? Yeah, this, this chart here. And the definite time is being set. So the doors close to the churches and of course that's when they begin doing their camp meetings because now they can't preach in the churches and uh, then we have of course uh, there's actually a first disappointment in there which isn't written in here but we have the midnight cry which happens in August of 1844 right so that uh, then leads to the third angel's message which is October 22nd, 1844. Christ goes into the most holy place. Judgment takes place. There's a great disappointment because people aren't looking for that event. And after that, there's miracles, visions, encouragement, which leads to true worship. And of course, in this case, you know, we could put the number seven in there, dealing with the Sabbath, right? That's this, this, this number seven. And then, of course, the future event is the fourth angel, 
which we're not to that point yet, but we're coming to that point. So that's that fourth angel. So we have a three-one combination. So this is a pattern that we see that actually ties all these different reform lines together. So it's, there's so much detail when it comes to the Bible. You know, I always feel like very insufficient, like I'm not doing enough, I'm not explaining enough. But every story in the Bible has these patterns throughout it. And they're all tied together. And we can see some are, are very detailed, have all the details. Some of these are just partial patterns. They're incomplete, they're not major reform lines. Uh, but the ones that are all tied together, they're tied together by that fourth angel. So you can see on there we have those three, the first, second, and third, like we looked at the first one. When the fourth angel's repeated, it's also a repeat of the second angel's message. So it's preceded by a first angel's message and followed by a third angel's message. So all these reform lines are tied together. So some amazing stuff as we look at it. Does anybody have any questions about this? I mean, I know I'm going to go into more detail when I deal with 144,000. Yes? I'm actually not familiar with this concept of the message. Okay, so the three angels' message. Okay, so Revelation 14. Does somebody want to read uh, Revelation 14, uh, starting at verse 6? Elizabeth. Yeah, and I, I do have it as a scripture song, so it's on my, my new scripture song album. That's it. Just uh, read the third, first three angels, the three angels' messages. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on earth, and to every nation, and kindred, and tongue, and people. Saying with a loud voice, Fear God, and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment is come, and worship Him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. And there followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations great, of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, if any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Okay, nobody can probably read my writing. Okay, so the first angel's message is the everlasting gospel being preached, the hour of his judgment has come. Second angel's message, Babylon has fallen. Now in the Millerite time period, this had to do with um, the Protestant church is now constituting Babylon, right? The third angel's message, what, how would you summarize the third angel's message? What's that? Fear God, okay. Right? So fear God, yes. Now this, of course, the third angel's message we understand as Seventh-day Adventists, this is righteousness by faith, right? That's what the third angel's message is. So in history, the first angel's message, you know, I mean, it came into history in 1833, but it was empowered in 1840, right? This is 18... 42, and this is 1844. And these parallels, these first, second, and third angels' message, we'll know that in Revelation 18, we have the fourth angels' message, which is a repeat of the first three. Okay? Does that make sense? Yes, Rick? I always thought the third one was come out of that one. Well, there is... Yes, there's the worship of the beast in his image. There's a bunch of things attached to it. Um, yes, sir. The angel, but it's an amplification of the... Yes, yeah, so the fourth angel is all the first three messages put together. Um, okay, can you read the third angel's message again, Bess? Yeah, the third one. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, 
Okay, that's really what I would put is. I would say it has to do with worship. That's better. Okay, so true worship. There, that, that makes more sense. So we have the hour of his judgment coming, Babylon has fallen, true worship, which of course is righteousness by faith is tied to it. The Sabbath comes from the third angel's message in the Millerite time period. Right, and of course the Sabbath is connected with righteousness by faith. Now the fourth angel's message, it's important to understand the idea that the fourth, this is what we call a three-one combination. And so this is throughout scripture. We can see it in, for instance, when I do my presentation this summer on the 2300 days, you know, from August 8th to 17th, um, you know, and uh, Wobberman at uh, what's it, Moonlight Bay Campground. Yes, so you, you, know, you should be there. It's in Alberta, by the way, if you're watching us on YouTube. But um, anyway, there is three decrees that begin, remember the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem. There is the decree of Cyrus, right? Of Darius and Artaxerxes. We'll just call him Art for short. Okay? But Artaxerxes also has a fourth decree. Okay? So at the beginning of the 2300 days, we have three decrees. At the end of the 2300 days, we have the three angels' messages. And of course, the fourth decree is just sums up all these three decrees together, right? And this pattern is throughout, when I did my presentation on Leviticus 26 in the book of Daniel, you can see this in the book of Daniel, you can see this in the, uh, the 2520 in Leviticus 26, where it mentions seven times, four times, the first three are, in, are distinct events. The fourth one ties all the first three 2520s together, right? So three, one combination. So this pattern is extremely important in scripture. And, uh, you know, it's something I'm new to, right? When I didn't know about it until, you know, maybe a year and a half ago. And then I started using it in the book of Daniel and just finding how it ties all these different time prophecies together and so forth. But it is throughout scripture. So it's not... It's one of those, um, you know, in rule, ru Miller's rules of biblical interpretation, he doesn't mention this per se. But the thing is, all of his rules are derived from the scriptures themselves. This is derived from the scriptures. It's by, by people studying the scriptures, they started to recognize these patterns. And one of the patterns, of course, is line upon line, which, uh, you know, we're dealing with, um, you know, which Tabo dealt with in his lecture. A delineation of events, prophecy is delineate, delineation, it's put upon a line. And in Isaiah chapter uh, 28, where it deals with line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little, we learn that that line is a measuring line, a line of judgment, right? So when God has these prophecies, these, these lines of prophecy, it's not talking about line upon line about a scripture verse, it's talking about a prophetic line. So this, this is one of those, those tools, just like uh, chiasms are important in understanding prophecy. Those are mirrors, right, prophetic mirrors. We have all kinds of things in scripture, but they come from the scriptures themselves. You know, what Tabo was talking about, the modern philosophy of hermeneutics is where we study the Bible as we would study any book or any document, right? When we study the scriptures, we study it on the basis of what the scriptures tell us to do. And some of these things, I mean, I've never heard anybody uh, mock the 3-1 combination. And maybe some people will once they figure out we're using it. But uh, a lot of the things that we, we find in the Bible, for instance, the proof text method, you know, people mock it. But it's actually what the Bible teaches. Yes, Rick? Well, in Revelation uh, 18, yeah, well, that's the repeat. So this is, where's that eraser? Here, so we'll get the scribble off of here. So put some more on. 
So when we look at the first and second and third angel's messages, right, uh, we can do this. Uh, the third angel's message, as some elements of the first angel's message, and the fourth angel's message as elements of the second angel's message. Okay? So these two messages both deal with Babylon. Okay? These both deal with uh, judgment and worship, but just in different aspects of it. So this is another way of looking at these messages. But also in your repeat, when you're going first, second, third, and then the fourth angel's message, the fourth angel's message is like this. You have the, so you can see that this is the same message. Does that make sense? So that's what ties the 3-1 combination together, is that fourth angel's message is a repeat of the second angel's message. Okay? So hopefully those things are helpful. We're going to stop here at this time, and then Tabo will do some more meetings, and then uh, I'll have the final meeting after that. So let's just close in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we again uh, are thankful for the Sabbath day and the time we have to study. We know, Lord, that uh, you have given us uh, time throughout the week to study your word. This is not the only time that we have to open your word. But we know, Lord, that we have neglected throughout our lives the study of your word. And uh, I know, Lord, that there's so much more that we should know. But we know, Lord, that you want to teach us and that we couldn't understand any of these things if you weren't there with your spirit to guide our minds. And so we are thankful for the things that you have shown us. And we ask for forgiveness for uh, the things that you have wanted to show us that we cannot see. We just ask, Lord, that your spirit can be sprinkled upon this meeting, that you can give us insight, that we can see things that angels desire to look into. And just be with us now in our break and in the meetings that will follow. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.